This quick tip is going to be just a little bit different. I'm going to take two of your requests uh, and combine them together into one quick tip. And you'll see how in a moment. The first one, though, had to do with a quick tip we did a couple of weeks ago that was dealing with light source. How images change according to where the light source is located. Well, this person wanted to see me also demonstrate that, so that will be part of it. But then the other one was uh, this one that asked that when I share brush stroke techniques for painting evergreens and conifers like pine, cedar, hemlock, and that sort of thing. So let's see how two work together. Let's address the brush strokes first because I'll be using those brush strokes when I do the, the second part. Now, the thing about brush strokes is there it, we don't use brush strokes according to um, images. In other words, this is the grass brush stroke or this is the pine or conifer brush stroke. That's too restrictive. It's better if you learn what a brush will do and then when you look at an image, you pick the brush stroke that you know that's going to best interpret that image. Now I know there are those videos, especially several years back, that would, would teach you this stroke for making a flower, flower petal and this stroke and so on and so on. That's just too restrictive. You'll find that if you learn what the brush does, how the brush behaves, and we have some brush stroke uh, quick tips that you can go back and, and look at. Um, then then you, then say when you look at an image what brush stroke do i know that will give me that image so if we what we know that that a flat brush will do well um let's say a brush that is flat and that has a little bit of flexibility in it um one thing it would of course it makes wonderful strokes just traditional strokes but another thing it will do it allows you to work on the tip and allows you to push the tip and lift to make a ragged edge. Now when I'm looking at a conifer, uh, it, of course the edges will vary according to whether it's a pine or hemlock or whatever, but the conifer edges, when they're all put together and we're looking at them from a distance, have those ragged edges. So let's just, just show that first of all. And you, if you practice this, and practice it in variations instead of, you know, just a single stroke for a single image, uh, then you see how it works. Now, you can you can push the brush stroke against the surface, and when you do that, just pushing the tip against the surface, you see you get an M, or you get kind of a, a shape like that, and you can see the edges are ragged. That's just sort of a stamp that we make, and we can use that in when we're interpreting. But then we can do this further thing of l allowing it to scoop up or scoop out like this. You see what that does? Just barely touching the surface. And be sure the brush is loaded when we're doing that. Barely touch the surface and allow the brush to scoop up, scoop out. And then it's the direction that you push that brush in that determines the stroke. Now how are you going to know which direction to push it in? Well, you look at the image. Because, and what... And you, you go by the, uh, the direction that the image is moving in. And so an image like this, for example, uh, starts out fat, like we see right in there, starts out fat. If I just push the brush there like that and allow the impression of the brush to show, we see we get that sort of ragged edge. And then if I see it sweeping in that direction, then I just move it in that direction. If it comes off a little bit too straight, then I'll just touch it a little bit with that edge, like that, and just let the brush barely touch the surface, and we get that kind of interpretation. So we need to uh, allow the brush to, or, or learn how the brush makes a uh, stroke in a kind of a, um, a traditional way, and then how many ways we can vary. So you see, you can 
just move the brush around like that and you can get that conifer edge you can use it uh, uh, if you're what, like working with pines and things like that you can do a similar thing where you lay it down and you scoot it back and forth like this you see for edges so learn what the brush will do and then you can learn the edges so that's the brush stroke uh, general it takes practice and you don't practice on your paintings you practice on some on a scrap sheet of canvas somewhere or watercolor paper. I mean, the same kind of stroke works best works well with all kind of mediums. Uh, but now let's think: what happens to when we use that stroke? We use this image. What happens uh, when we're trying to reinterpret a light source? Now we have here an image where there's backlight. How do we know that? Because we see the cast shadow in front. So uh, we we feels it feels very foggy back there. But there's a light back there. There's a sun, the, at least the sunlight is back strong enough so it's causing a cast shadow in front. And we don't see any, really any light up here. So we get kind of variations of dark. But what if we want that light source? So we don't have... What if we've got a whole bunch of trees? I believe the person asked me to really use figures. Well, the, the, the principle works just the same no matter what you use. Say if you've got a whole bunch of trees, well... Or a whole bunch of people, or a bunch of anything, everything's going to have the same kind of light source on it. Because if there's one sun in the sky, those rays are all going to be coming from the same direction. So again, going to be hitting things pretty much according to wh or where the sun is located, uh, determined by where the sun is located. All right. So the best way to figure that out is to do my NOTAN, where if you don't know about NOTAN, uh, we've got quick tips on NOTAN. You can just go to the uh, our channel page, click on videos in the menu, you'll find all the quick tips there. Or we have also on that page, you'll find a free video, a NOTAN how and why. So I've got lots, of, and also on the website, there are on the lessons website, diamonds.com, there, there's a series on NOTAN. And on the academy, diamondsacademy.com, there are there's a full course on doing no tan. So no tan enables us to plot onto our canvas where the lights and shadows are. All right, let's let's just take some. Uh, I'll show you how that works. Now let's assume you know the sun can be almost anywhere in the sky depending on where you are. Uh, so the sun might be in front of you like this, uh, or it might be behind you. It might, as far as where it is, it's, it's, it's in a three-dimensional location. So it might be somewhere like uh, in that direction or in that direction. So the best way to study it is to actually study images in the sunlight, watching what happens to an image, uh, depending on the position of the sun as related to where you are. So you could change your position and you can get a diff different position of the sun. So let's say, let's assume right here, if the sun is located, it's hard for me to show you three-dimensionally, if the sun is located sort of like this, I don't know if you can see that, what I'm doing there, but I've got the sun, uh, if I'm in front of the image, then the sun is to my left and about, what would that be, about uh, an 11 o'clock, 10 or 11 o'clock position in the sky, but more or less to my left the sun rays then will be and you will if uh watch that quick tip uh 392 i think it said it was the rays where the rays of the sun are coming it's going to be hitting the surfaces where the rays of the sun can't hit it's going to be in shadow and so the no 10 will show us that so let's say if in that case then the rays are going to be hitting this part right here if this is on the other side of the tree right there that will probably be more in shadow right in there now and then if it's hitting more uh, hitting the other part of the tree like right in here it's going to be more in shadow catching maybe a little bit of light right in there but uh as it comes down the sun is going to be less there'll be less a uh, fewer rays hitting as you're coming down as you're coming down than they are as you go up and so, and then we have the cast shadow. Let's see if I can get that, get that really communicating now, what the sun is doing. And there'll be some little small cast shadows over here where those little boughs are, are casting shadows. And uh, so 
So let's see if we can get that sort of plotted here. Sort of over on this side, on the back side, then it will be in shadow. So that's how we would show that in no tan. To paint that, uh, we would go into, I've got uh, just a value line of uh, yellow green here. And, and so this would be very simplistic. I know it's going to, uh, so we won't go into the color theory of it, just the, what the values are doing. But in those, dark, in those deeper shadow areas, we sort of have something like this. Now watch how I'm using the brush. I'm using it this way right here, only I'm using it faster. And I'm looking over here now to interpret the shapes I'm seeing. So I always like to plot the shadow in first. And so we would do that. And then coming on down here, and since that's grass, we have that cast shadow that's on, on the grass. But the cast shadow, then in that case, is going to be more behind it, more like that, coming down this way. And I'm probably got it too narrow, too wide right there. All right, then as it goes up, uh, there'll be some shadow on the bottom side of these boughs, especially in the bottom. As it goes up, you'll see probably fewer but you'll see more shadow on this side. And so the light will be hitting something like that. Now, let's go on the uh, go on to the other one. And this time I'm going instead of taking the time to go no tan first, I'm just going to go ahead and plot the shadow in in one value. Now, suppose the sun were on this side. Suppose the sun were up here, where would the light rays be hitting? Light rays would be hitting these areas right here, and it causes just the opposite thing to happen in here. So I look at this shape, look at this shape, and sort of interpret. There'll be a little bit of a cast shadow coming down like that, perhaps, and and then more. More we usually see uh, when the sun is at an angle like that coming down. We usually see more shadow at the bottom of an image, but you can you can observe that for yourself. And then uh, as it goes up, and the sun is at this angle, so so uh, I'm going on the wrong side of that. I'm doing it backwards. The sun's coming at this angle, so at this angle, so we'll see the cast shadow taking. I mean, the shadow side taking on the angle of the light, so it takes on something like that. And we, then we have more shadow on the side up here, depending on where the sun is up. And, and you can continue like that. Just ask yourself, I mean, uh, imagine, not just ask, imagine, imagine the sun, its location, and then feel those rays coming down from the sun. Where are they hitting? And now I'm going to move in and just very quickly, now these quick tips don't give, uh, give us enough time to show you a, a real lesson on this, but this should get you started. So I will go in now to the middle value. Now let's go, first of all, the sun, with the sun over here, then we're going to get more a middle value or transition value uh, in these areas up here. We're not seeing a real difference in value there. Let me go in a little bit lighter. There we go. And then as it goes to the top, we'll see more of some shallow shadow, perhaps, in these areas right in here. On this side, the sun coming in this way, we're going to see more of that middle value. Uh, right in here, sort of right in there, like that, and you'll see some on the underside where the bowels are moving, or are, are not being hit by the light rays. Same thing over here uh, with the sun on this side. All right, now I'm going to rinse the brush, and we'll go into the lights, and we'll we'll develop those areas where where the light would be falling. So on this side, I mean on this one, I'm going into the lighter color here. Now remember I said this is very simplistic. Uh, it works better when you study it and you really locate that stuff for yourself. So you could call this a theoretical approach just to help you to see what happens there. So let's say uh, there, the sun, this side would be picking up more light. Let's get that a little bit better. This side would be picking up more light right in here. There'll be some light reflecting back on the shadow side, perhaps on the tops. Sun's coming from this direction, so the light will be hitting here. And, and the angle of the light is always, uh, per, you might say, perpendicular to the angle of the sun rays. So if the sun rays are coming from here, then the angle of division where light meets shadow is more or less going to be perpendicular to that. 
this is the sort of thing you can look for. Don't don't take this as rule making because it's not. It's just showing you how to look for these things and, and how to interpret them. And it is possible to take any scene and put that scene into a different lighting, a totally different lighting situation, uh, just by imagining where the sun where the sun's located. So we will just sort of do a little bit of an imagination. Now, look, looking over here, uh, and we need to always refer back to what is the subject doing. And we can see, and you see, I'm moving that brush around in the the movement in the direction of those bows. So put a, I'm going to go back with the with the uh, middle value now, and begin to sort of refine. And it was here. I'll pay more attention now to the shapes of those bows, or the texture of those bows. And of course, the the uh, the strength of that light, I'm going to get that too dark over there, the strength of that light is determined by uh, how bright sunlight is. Is the sunlight very, very bright, or is it being blocked by clouds? And now I'll go over here on this side, and let's give that, because the sun is coming here, to give that a little bit more of a feeling of a shadow side right over here. Sort of like that. My preference is, is to uh, paint by, by looking at the image rather than by saying tree and then paint tree, that sort of thing. So this is this sort of thing should be done as a practice exercise, but you're better off if you 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 get a truer interpretation of whatever you're painting if you actually paint from nature. Now painting from photographs is a second choice. Uh, but the photographs don't always show us everything. Now we're gonna put just a little bit more in here to show that deeper shadow. Just a little bit more as it goes up. And you see I'm just allowing, I want you to watch what the brush is doing. I'm just allowing the tip of the brush now to define those edges. And so we can go over here. I still don't have that quite. I'm not going to do this as a finished little piece. I just want to show you how the principle works. You see I'm using the tip of the brush there. And I think the faster you work, the faster you move your brush, the better off, or the, the, uh, the more spontaneous the image is. And um, so that maybe would get you started on how that would work. Let's do, I put just a little bit more light. I'll go up in the white here and put just a little bit more light. Let's assume the sun is shining brighter. Now, if, if, I, had the, if I had the blue sky in there, uh, we, we would have that more clearly defined. But that's probably enough right there. Now, the same thing would be true on the other side. Uh, and you probably would say, well, why don't you do the other side? My, my purpose is to guide you so that you can go forward. All right, so now you can see, start out with a, uh, a pre preliminary drawing to start with is a good idea. There, you capture the movement of the image, wh whatever the image is. And these conifers have this, uh, well, depending on the conifer, but you often see this this particular kind of conifer has that sweeping up. Some of them have a sweeping out, uh, sweeping down movement. Some sweep out, down, up. They've got all kinds of things going on, but that captures the gesture of and and, and helps to communicate what the image actually is. So we have there the preliminary, then the no tan part, where first just indicate where the shadow is, the shape of the shadow, and the direction, uh, and the angle uh, at which the light is hitting the image, and then go back in and get put in the variations of values. The darker darks where the shadows are deeper, uh, the shadows a little bit lighter where they're not quite so deep, and on the light side, uh, the, we have that range of from the low light to very, very light, depending on how light you see it. So this, this is not something you want to do when you are in the middle of a painting. Practice it just like a baseball player, 
uh, uh, a pitcher, baseball pitcher, will practice behind the scenes uh, the way he's training his body for how he throws that ball so he make it do what he wants it to do. He doesn't do that practice during the game. Well, we painters need to take that same attitude. So practice what the brush will do, practice what the light is doing and how you use the brush to interpret what the light's doing. And before you know it, you'll be able to paint uh, conifers or any other kind of thing in nature. Be sure and view all of our quick tips. And while you're doing so, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell, so you'll always get a notice when we produce a new quick tip, which is every week. And if you have a question, leave it in the comments section and we'll make a quick tip for you. Also, take a trip over to DianeMize.com where I have full length lessons, downloads, DVDs, lots of other stuff there, some free stuff for you. And while you're there, you can subscribe to the newsletter and that way you'll always be informed every time we do something new.